Hello and thanks for joining us today. We're coming to you live from our studios here in the centre of Cardiff. Today we're bringing you the behind the scenes investigation into a case of revenge porn that saw celebrity Big Brother winner Stephen Bear sent to prison. I hope that this puts anyone off committing this sort of crime and I hope for anyone else who's been victim of it, it gives them some sort of justice. Thank you so much. Do you feel any remorse? This is Crime Watch Live. Good morning and thank you for all your calls this week. We had some possible sightings of those stolen coffee machines that we showed you yesterday and some names put forward for the suspects too. So we'll of course tell you more on that when we can. Today on their 10th anniversary, we are joined by the National Crime Agency to look at their most wanted fugitives. We'll be finding out why this firearms dog needs human grade body armor. And we're asking for help to identify a woman whose remains were found in the woodlands on the edge of the Yorkshire Moors. She remained one of the more enduring mysteries for North Yorkshire police and indeed probably for most of the north of England. Detectives are with us throughout the programme and our team are ready to take your calls until midday. So remember, if you have any information about the appeals, you can call us on 08000 468 You can also text us 24 hours a day on 63399. Just text the word crime, leave a space and then write your message. Your text will be charged at your standard message rate or you can always send us an email. That's the address cwl at bbc.co.uk. First, though, in our series of films looking at detective work behind the headlines, we're with Essex Police to hear about their landmark investigation into revenge porn. This film contains strong content. I want to let all other victims of this crime know that I stand in solidarity with them. I hope that this puts anyone off committing this sort of crime and I hope for anyone else who's been victim of it, it gives them some sort of justice. Thank you so much. Do you feel any remorse? Georgia Harrison is a reality star famous for appearing on shows like Love Island. It was whilst appearing on reality show The Challenge that she met Stephen Bear, a social media influencer who, at the time, had more than one and a half million followers. Bear's fast, he's strong, and he's got a lot of heart, so I've got a lot of faith in Bear. I just think he's the best. So excited because I was happy just to film another season with Georgia again. The pair lived near each other in Essex, and on the 2nd of August 2020, Stephen Bear invited Georgia around for a drink. They ended up having sex in the garden. What Georgia didn't know was that Stephen Bear's garden was rigged with a network of concealed security cameras. Later that evening, he told her that he'd recorded the whole thing. Stephen played the footage. Georgia was really upset and asked him to delete the footage. Georgia had said that he could never send the footage to anyone. But almost immediately, he did exactly that. And when Georgia saw, she was really upset and Stephen said that he had unsent the message. Then a few months later, thinking the footage had been deleted, Georgia was alerted to rumors of a video circulating online. Georgia was sent the clip that was about 20 minutes in length and it was a screen recording from the CCTV system. The intimate video had been uploaded to adult websites. 
Georgia asked for help from people who may have seen the video and that she asked for the video to be sent to her. She wanted to find out where it was published so she could get it removed. All the time, more and more people were viewing it. Georgia was also having a, a public breakdown, which she recorded videos and posted them online. At first, Bear denied he was the one who had published the video, and then he claimed the woman wasn't even Georgia. So she hired an ethical hacker to investigate. They found a copy of the video with a watermark that suggested it had originally been uploaded to a site called OnlyFans. The watermark also displayed the name of the OnlyFans account holder, Hollywood Bear. She initially tried to get a family member of Stevens to take it down. George was unsuccessful there, so she reported it to police. For detectives, the video itself contained vital evidence. During the footage, Stephen looks up at one of the cameras. From reviewing the video, Georgia doesn't seem to be aware of any cameras within the garden. Convinced that Bear had knowingly filmed Georgia without her consent, detectives arrested him on suspicion of voyeurism. Now they had to prove that he was the one who had published the content, so they turned their attention to the OnlyFans watermark. I knew it had been uploaded to his verified account, but I didn't know by who. Detectives secured evidence from OnlyFans about the account's activity. I established when the video had been uploaded and I was able to look at certain IP addresses that had been used around that time. Two of those were linked to Stephen Bear. Then there was only one of two options, either he uploaded the video or someone else uploaded the video that he had sent them. I needed to prove links further between Stephen Bear and his OnlyFans account. I made an application to access his financial records to see any payments going in from the website. People who wished to view the video on OnlyFans had to have a subscription. The bank account the money was going into was Stephen Bear's. The bank account showed several deposits of money from the website that he had used to upload the video. There was enough evidence to charge him with voyeurism and revenge porn. He denied any wrongdoing and made jokes about it on his YouTube channel. Um, you got any garage out free cards? Hey, Banda. A month before trial, Bear suddenly changed his story and suggested it was the fault of an employee. And that they had been employed to upload content and reply to messages on Stephen's website. But in a statement to court, that employee made clear that anything uploaded to Bear's account had been put there by Bear himself or at Bear's direct request. On the 13th of December, 2022, Bear was convicted of voyeurism and two counts of revenge porn. Would you like um, to apologise to Georgia Harrison? And as we can see, just keep recording, babe. As we can see, um, everyone has already made up their minds about me already. Do you feel any remorse? He was sentenced to 21 months in prison. I just want to say that I'm happy and relieved that this matter is finally over. Today's sentence is a vindication of what I've been put through and sends a clear message that the police and the courts take this matter very seriously. I want to let all other victims of this crime know that I stand in solidarity with them and I have absolutely no regrets on waiving my anonymity. I hope that this puts anyone off committing this sort of crime and I hope for anyone else who's been victim of it, it gives them some sort of justice. Thank you so much for all of your support and, yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, I'm joined now by Sophie Mortimer, who manages the Revenge Porn Helpline, which is part of Safer Internet, a global partnership that works to ensure everyone gets better online protection. Sophie, thanks so much for, for coming in and joining us in the studio today. This was a real landmark case, wasn't it, in a relatively new area of law. So, so what does the law encompass? The law covers the sharing of people's private sexual images that are shared without consent and with an intention to cause distress. Uh, we know that most of the people affected are women, women have more images shared and we know that images can then be shared on further, so it's a growing problem. And so far this year it's a significant number of people that have reported images being shared, isn't it? Absolutely, across all the channels that people can contact us, we've had over 12,000 people get in touch already. Yeah, that's a huge amount. So exactly what are the laws surrounding revenge porn as a whole? So currently it's against the law to share somebody's private sexual content, which will include sexual activity or nudity, without the consent of the people in that content and with an intention to cause distress. But we know that the law has been imperfect um, and we've really welcomed work by government and the online safety bill that's coming shortly is going to change that and uh, we, we anticipate that helping people much more effectively in the future. Yeah, that's good to hear that some positive changes could be, could be made. Let's talk in a bit more detail about the helpline then. How does it support victims? It's really important that we just we hear what people say to us, acknowledge what they've experienced. We talk to them about the law and what going to the police would be like, um, but really key to everyone. And the first thing they ask for is about the removal of any content that has been shared online. So that's a huge part of the work. Um, we've re removed up to over 300,000 individual images now, and we have a 90% takedown rate. People can come to us, they share links with us where they have them, or we can use some facial recognition technology to, to try and identify where content has been shared and then report it for takedown. It's, it's really good to hear, and I think reassurance is, is key, isn't it? I'm sure when you're speaking to victims, just to give them that peace of mind and knowing that the support is out there for them. That's absolutely true. There is an idea that once something is online, it's there forever, and that's not entirely true. There is a lot that can be done. There's a lot of cooperation from the tech industry, and, and we are clearly very good at what we do. Well, clearly, I mean, you mentioned the success already. Ta takedown rate, as you said, 90%. Was it last year, 3,200 victims directly contacted you? That's right, that's through calls and emails directly to the helpline, uh, and we, we are going to be busier this year. Is there any way, Sophie, that people can protect themselves against this online image abuse? Fortunately, technology is improving all the time. Uh, we have a, a new platform that we built with Meta called stopncii.org, and it gives people the opportunity to create digital hashes of their own intimate content that can stop it being shared or reshared across our participating platforms. And that's growing all the time. There's more cooperation across industry. And it, it's an empowering tool. It gives people something that they can do actively to protect themselves in a time of crisis. And finally, what steps should people take if they do sadly become a victim of revenge porn? Please don't panic. You're not alone. There is help available. And please remember that this is not your fault. The fault entirely lies with the person who has done this betrayal of, of, of someone. So uh, just get in touch. We'll always be there to help. Really good to hear. Sophie, thanks so much again for joining us on the programme this morning. Thank you for having me. Ralph. Earlier this week, we brought you the story of the National Crime Agency and how they stopped a criminal enterprise that was supplying fraudulently obtained passports to some of the UK's most notorious organised criminals. Well, after 12,000 arrests, the National Crime Agency turns 10 tomorrow. Quite a milestone. Jill Duggan is head of Europe uh, for the NCA's International Division. She's with us now. Thanks for joining us uh, this morning, Jill. Just tell us a little bit about the NCA. Yes, yeah, so the National Crime Agency's aim is to protect the public from serious and organised crime. Serious and organised crime causes the most harm to most people than any other national security threat. Um, our aim is to protect against all serious and organised crime and our priorities are fraud, organised immigration crime, child sexual abuse, cybercrime and drugs. And our work has led to a number of really positive results. 
Yeah, you've done loads. I mean, you're very good at disrupting as well, aren't you? Disrupting criminality. Yes, yeah, since, uh, since we were established 10 years ago, our activities have led to 23,000 disruptions and over 21,000 years of jail sentences. Brilliant. I mean, see some of the other headlines there. The amount of arrests we mentioned, 2,000 tonnes of drugs seized, over 3,000 firearms off the streets, thanks to you. So some brilliant work as well. Now, the NCA's been on before. We've heard about your most wanted gallery we've helped with some some faces that you needed to identify and you've had some success since you were last on yeah so since our last appeal in March 2022 we had some significant arrests uh, following that appeal um, in uh, Morocco and in Bulgaria and then last year um, we arrested somebody in Portugal who was wanted by Greater Manchester Police and they were earlier this year sentenced to 30 years imprisonment for murder and wounding with intent so some really Really serious offences there and, and great that you finally managed to capture them. However, the work doesn't stop. There's two more faces we're going to show now. We need your help at home to find where these people are. Let's start with the first one there. What can we see? John James Jones. So Jones is suspected of wounding with intent. He allegedly stabbed two individuals repeatedly with a knife causing serious injury in May, April 2018, um, and he is wanted by Lancashire Police. OK, so he's 33 years old, white male, around six foot tall, stocky with dark hair. OK, uh, any idea where he could currently be? So we know he fled the country after the incident and stayed in Madrid the following evening. He has links to Ibiza and he was previously in the UK in Autumn in Lancashire. OK, certainly have a look out for him. And next to him, we can see another face you'd like to find out where he is at the moment. Now, this is someone who we've had on the Crime Watch uh, Wanted Faces Gallery many times. This is Jack Mayle. Um, tell me about him. Yeah, so uh, Mail is suspected of supplying MDMA and diazepam between 2019 and 2020. Um, he has a number of distinguishing tattoos. Some that I'll draw your attention to is the one you can see on the picture, is the diamond under the left um, eye. He also has um, a tattoo of uh, saying Croydon on his left forearm, as well as tattoos on his left hand saying many never sleeps and across his fingers of both hands is tattooed trap star he also has tattoos on his neck and his back although we do know that he may have tried to change his identity okay and just a few more points on him um linked to croydon born in croydon 32 years old five foot 11 and described as muscular any ideas at the moment where jack Mayle may be no, we do know that he fled um, after he was charged um, and he had um, links to, he does have links to Spain and he was from, he was known to be in the Surrey area. OK, and if you just look behind us here, we're going to have some more faces that you'd like to trace. We'll start with in the middle there, Asim Naveed. What can you tell us about him? Yeah, so Naveed is suspected of being a member of an organised crime group who was who was responsible for um, bringing cocaine across Wales. And um, he has a distinguishing mark of a surgical scar on his left hand. OK, yes. Described as six foot two tall, so quite tall, also muscular build. And next to him, we can see another male there, uh, Calvin Paris. What can you tell us about him? So um, Paris is suspected of supplying cocaine. Um, he was a customer of Naveed and um, he has a distinguishing feature of um, gold upper teeth and both have um, links to the Cardiff area. OK, and he's described as a black male, 5'11", tall, medium build, and as you say, the gold upper teeth and aged either 31 or 32. Now, from what you've mentioned so far, a, a, a few of these do have links abroad. And how do you go about actually getting them back? Yeah, so um, if we identify um, any of these in individuals abroad, we work closely with local police and law enforcement agencies. We have 140 international liaison officers across the world working with law enforcement agencies, as well as Interpol. And we would work with them to start 
get them arrested, mm -hmm. charged and start the extradition process and work with them to get them back to the UK to serve their sentences uh, as quickly as possible. So it's a, a huge job, but it's one you're experts in. You've done incredibly well so far in your last 10 years. I'm sure that is going to continue as we move forward and hopefully we'll get you some answers with these four faces today, Jill. Thank you. There are, I should say, still a number of fugitives on the Most Wanted website, and viewers can take a look. The details of that are below right now. And if you know the whereabouts of any of these faces, do pick up the phone and get in touch. The number to call us is also on the screen below by the clock. Back in 2019, we launched an appeal to help find a 27-year-old man from West London who had gone missing. Next, on the 7th of May, Mohammed Shah Subhani left his house in Hounslow, West London, but he never returned. Detectives are convinced the 27-year-old was murdered, but nobody has been found and mystery surrounds the case. Uh, well, Mohammed Subhani, or Shah, as he was affectionately known, had disappeared without a trace, leaving his family and friends distraught and concerned for his welfare. Well, after that appeal, police learnt about a dispute between members of Shah's family and a man called Amraj Panea, who at the time was a friend of Shah's. Police were able to conduct a forensic search of Panea's business premises, where they discovered small samples of blood. They arrested Panea soon after, but he denied any involvement. Telling this on live camera. Yeah, right. You pig, rat, snitch, right. gangster right. wannabe. Right. You're right. dead. Right. Detectives still weren't able to locate Shah's body. Then, after six months, they had a breakthrough. His remains were discovered badly burnt and in a shallow grave near Gerrard's Cross in Buckinghamshire. It took four years of dedicated work by the team, but this summer, Amraj Panea was found guilty of murder at the Old Bailey and was sentenced yesterday to 25 years. Now, another three men were also found guilty of perverti perverting the course of justice and received sentences between three and seven years. Our next appeal details one of North Yorkshire's strangest unsolved mysteries. It's a puzzling cold case dating back more than 40 years. August 1981 in rural North Yorkshire. The body of a woman is discovered by police. All the police know about the woman is that she was aged about 40, five feet one or two, with false teeth and short brown hair. This is unusual in as much that we have no identity of the body that was found. Uh, it's rather strange as much that it is badly decomposed. Do you have any idea how she met her death? Unfortunately, at this stage, no. So you're faced with an utter mystery then, aren't you? Completely, yes. She remained one of the more enduring mysteries for North Yorkshire police and indeed probably for most of the north of England. All of this happened before Adam Harlan's time. But as manager of the Cold Case Review Unit, he's now in charge of the investigation. It started back in 1981, when a call was made to Ripon Police Station by a man who describes having found a body amongst the Rose Bay Willow Herb on the road to Scorton. The caller refused to give his details. When he's asked why, he says it's national security. I doubt it was national security. We've never been able to trace that individual. The anonymous caller said the body could be found on a minor road near Sutton Bank, an escarpment in the North York Moors. Officers took some time to find it in dense vegetation. The area had to be cleared. They had to scythe the way through the undergrowth to find this body and the skeleton of a female was found, but in a state of decomposition, suggesting that she had been dumped at that location. Other evidence uncovered at the site suggested she'd been there for some time. Underneath the body was found a yoghurt pot top, which contained the date of the 6th of September, 1979. 
that would suggest that the body had to have been placed on top of that in sometime in 1979. That same year, a local horse rider noticed a pungent smell as he passed the spot, but he didn't report it at the time. Forty-three years on, the scenes changed, but the same questions remain. The woods have grown up, the vegetation has changed, and it's a pretty miserable place to have your body just dumped by the side of a road somewhere. The circumstances of his lady's death point towards it being an unnatural death. We don't think she died in this location, uh, but she's been brought to this location after her death. She could have been from anywhere. So detectives worked with what they had, which was the skeleton. We know that she has given birth two or perhaps three times. The post-mortem examination revealed an unusual deformity. Her C1 vertebra was malformed, and that meant that her skull may have sat at a slightly strange angle to the top of her neck. This is described at the time as saying that the lady might have had stooped shoulders. In an unusual move for the time, scientists and Granada TV's makeup department were asked to help. A wax head was made based upon the features of her skull to provide a representation of what this lady looked like in real life. Missing women were traced because of the appeal, but it didn't offer any new leads. As there seemed no chance of positively identifying the remains, two years after she was found, the woman was buried in the cemetery at Moulton. Twenty-eight years later, with scientific advances in DNA, the team hoped for a breakthrough. We applied to the coroner for an exhumation, which allows us to carry out further examinations. And from that examination, we were able to establish this lady's genetic identity, her DNA. So what we have is a small improvement, perhaps, but otherwise a mystery which is now rolling on into its fifth decade. But investigators haven't given up hope. Here in front of us is a patch of earth where Our Lady is. It's certainly nicer than being left in the undergrowth. But you realise that for most people, they've been missed. There are people who love them, people who remembered them, and people who wanted to memorialise them. And sadly, as we stand at the moment, that's not the case with this lady. But perhaps we could do something to make sure that people knew who she was and give her a chance to be remembered. really is a mystery. Well, I'm joined now by Adam Harland from North Yorkshire Police. Really good to have you back with us, Adam. Uh, you've been on the programme before to talk about this case, um, but after the last time, was there any new information that was brought to light? Morning, Michelle. Yes, after the last programme, we were approached by over 30 people giving us 25 or so different names, and we've been able to eliminate all but one of those and we are hoping that maybe somebody will be able to help us with identifying a lady who's described to us as Joyce Curley or Joyce Curling. Uh, we believe she lived in Dalton, a village near to Sutton Bank during the 1970s, and she was married to a Canadian gentleman called Vic, who worked, we believe, for either the RAF or the Army at Topcliffe, a uh, local barracks or military establishment. And we're really hoping that someone will be able to help us in identifying either Joyce or her family so that we can move towards eliminating her as our deceased. 
mean, this is a significant development, isn't it, Adam? But you're still keeping open-minded that it could be another woman, potentially. So let's recap on those details again. Well, it takes us all the way back to August bank holiday in 1981, when there's an anonymous call to Ripon Police Station telling us that there's a body uh, in the lane between the A170, which is the Thirsk to Scarborough Road, just after Sutton Bank, as you head towards Scarborough. Uh, it's a lane towards a place called Scorton or towards Revo Abbey, and there's a body in the Rose Bay Willow Herb there. Uh, we've attended and recovered the remains of a female who at the time was unidentified and sadly remains unidentified. Uh, we know that she'd been there for a while. Underneath the body was a yoghurt pot cover with a date from 1979. So we believe that she has been at that location since sometime in 1979 through to August 1981. But from examination of her remains, she has been there at least for 12 or 18 months. Gosh. So it'd be somebody who's not been seen probably since 1979. Yeah, for, for a long time. Um, let's have another look at the reconstruction that you made um, of the woman. You believe that this um, will may have been what she, she looked like. What other clues do you have about her? Well, the reconstruction was made at the time around her skull. Uh, so the shape of her face will be about right and the hair length we know is right. She had dark brown hair. Otherwise, what we know of her is that she had had two or perhaps three children. She was five foot two tall. Uh, she was a smoker, but also had lost quite a lot of her teeth. Uh, she had at some stage fractured her right ankle, but we don't know at what stage in her life that she'd done that. And she had a malformation of her neck. Now, at the time, that was described that perhaps it would cause her to hold her head at an angle. More recent research uh, suggests it's rather more common than perhaps was thought in 1981. And it might only have been a matter of stiff shoulders or perhaps headaches, uh, which would have manifested themselves for this lady. You, you're urging what... people to cast their minds back, aren't you, Adam? Absolutely. What we would like is for people to think about this description or perhaps those people interested in their family histories to look at those histories. And if there's somebody who is missing or there's somebody from your family background, uh, perhaps the rest of the family never spoken about and seeing if this lady is that individual. Uh, we know if we get 100 names, 99 of them are going to be wrong. Don't be shy about it all, because if we can have the one correct name, we'll be able to give this lady her identity back That's and perhaps explain about. why she's there. Absolutely, yeah. Adam. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Thanks again for joining us on the programme. So do you have any hunches or ideas on who this woman could be? Please do call us on 08000 468 999. Last series, we showed you a film about PC Alan Smith and his dog police dog Blue, who had a terrifying encounter with a man armed with a huge machete. Right, stand still, do not move. Do not move. Right, no, stand still, stand still. No, no, stop, mate. stop, 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 stop. Oh, it's terrifying. Blue was actually stabbed and luckily survived, but with 1,400 police dogs working in the UK, many of them are risking their lives alongside officers. That's why our next guest designed a set of armour specifically for working dogs, and I'm joined by Roger Utley, the man behind the design, and PC Simeon Darrell Jones from West Mercia Police, and not forgetting his firearms dog, Gremlin, who you can see there, who shall be our model later today. So thank you all uh, for coming in today. Roger, let me start with yourself. What made you decide you needed to manufacture this? Um, I spent a lot of years as a, a military working dog handler. And in the past, there wasn't specific, well-made um, equipment for mm -hmm. working dogs. So I used to get my own maid. And then I was working alongside the prison service one day. They saw a harness that I'd used, asked me to sort of produce something for them. And okay. then by chance, the, the people that were making my equipment were body armor specialists. So we, we put our heads together to make a day-to-day -day working harness. And then um, 
ad armor as and when the threat was uh, needed. So you've got uh, an example here that we can see. So it's a, it can be worn as a harness. Yes. But if you have operational needs, such as Simeon would have at work here, you can actually slide in the, the various inserts. Yes, so you'll have an insert for the main body and then an insert in the, the chest panel and it all inserts from inside. Um, so if the threat for the police they want multi-threat, so stab, spike, and ballistic, mm -hmm. where other threat, the prison, it was more the stab and spike threat rather than ballistic. So the, the user unit could pick what armor was put in for their specific That makes sense. Harnesses. And then it's the different inserts that would go in. But it, it sounds, and certainly from my experience many years ago when I was in the police and you put on the ballistic jackets, it, they are heavy, they are bulky. Yeah. These don't look the same. Does it affect the dog's agility in any way? Not really. This is the whole point. It got lighter and lighter for humans, so we're doing this for the dogs now. So we're looking at how can we make it as agile as possible but also offer protection. Brilliant. Yeah, it's got to be a win-win there. I mean, it? Gremlin looks very happy. <laughs> she She's does. very chilled she this does. morning. Just, just loving life. From your perspective, though, Simeon, how important is this kit for, for working dogs like Gremlin? It's very important. Um, you know, um, if our dogs are protected, then officers and the public are protected, and I keep Gremlin in her armour at all times when she's at work. Um, she'll often be sent to search areas prior to officers, and as a firearm support dog, um, she's sent to look and locate individuals who uh, who might uh, pose a danger to officers or the public and have weapons. So to have protection against uh, edge weapons or mm -hmm. ballistics is really, really important. Yeah, this is the thing, isn't it? You've seen firsthand just how beneficial these, these kits can be. Absolutely, yeah, really beneficial, especially in our force um, in West Mercia. In 2018, we had two dogs um, stabbed. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, both of them survived. Um, but, you know, if a dog gets injured, then it does put the public and officers and handlers are at risk. So um, knowing that she goes to work in the same protection that I've got mm. is really, really gives me a huge peace of mind. Um, I think it's great to see that chief constables are really valuing their work in dogs and taking measures to protect them. Um, and, and we're now starting to see more and more forces rolling it out. Oh, that's, that's good to hear to because I guess them becoming more widespread is, is something that you want to see. It would be, yeah, it's really good. Um, like I say, it gives me that peace of mind that she's protected. Mm. So it's really positive. Does she know? when she puts it on, that it's time for work. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, it's definitely that indicator, um, you know, the, the suit's gone on and uh, it's time to go out and, and catch some baddies. Yeah. That's what I'm like when I put my heels on. Oh, <laughs> Is that right? You know you're doing work. this. <laughs> Roger, just listening to Simeon there, though, it must feel really rewarding to know that what you've created is actually making a real difference. Yeah, it is. Once, you know, you come up with an idea, you think it's good, but it's the end user, guys like here, that, you know, want to put it on the dogs and that's the main thing. They're not using it because they've been told to. They recognise it's an uh, effective piece of equipment and they want to use it, so that's, you know, the good bit. And there's a lot yeah. of forces that you've heard that, that are interested or, or using this sort of Yeah, a lot of interest. Yeah. Um, we've got police forces up and down the country now okay. uh, using it. I think we're in double, double numbers Brilliant. now of forces, prison service and certain security companies as well allowed to have it, so, uh, yeah, it's getting more popular. Yeah. It's really good to hear, really and that's good. a slightly different one that you've got there, isn't it? The yeah, so camera. slightly more modern. types. Yeah, slightly more modern. Obviously, it's camouflage. We're looking at different markets, and, and that's the whole point. We've got the agility side of it right, the mm -hmm. fit right. We're just looking now more and more modern materials to try and get it lighter and, and lighter, and that's the purpose of this, you know. Brilliant. Absolutely. Thank you so Keep much, guys. Thank you. Uh, it's all about the pooches today, isn't it? It's time to meet another uh, incredible police dog now. She's called Stella, and she's awesome. <laughs> I am PC Claire Todd and I work for Gloucestershire Constabulary. I absolutely love dogs. From the age of 11, I wanted to be a police dog handler. My mum took me to a display and I just thought, that's what I want to do. And uh, luckily my dreams came true. So I started off with a German Shepherd and then progressed to having a drugs dog as well. He just decided one day he didn't want to be a police dog anymore. He just stopped searching, so the decision was made that he would retire. And I was desperately looking for, a, out of the blue, a new drugs dog. The first time I saw Stella, it was this happy, smiley staffy with her tail wagging, and she came running up to me and gave me loads of sloppy staffy kisses and just really wanted to say hello. She had been rescued, found abandoned on the streets, and. And I thought, oh, you know, she's so friendly. It was extremely unusual for a Staffordshire Terrier to become a police dog. At the time, nine years ago, they were known as status dogs for, for gangs. So there was a big stigma around them during that time, and a lot of people were scared. They saw them as, you know, nasty, aggressive dogs. 
Katie just like blew me away, really. You know, she totally instantly changed my view of the breed and of the dog. So I said, well, I'd be stupid not to give her a go. It's normally a six week course. Um, Stella just flew through the course in four weeks. She was super intelligent, super clever, and she just breezed through it. For a Staffordshire Bull Terrier, the first in the country, you need to achieve a, a license as a police dog. Especially with the stigma they still had, it was an incredible achievement and I was just so proud. In her first week of her career, we helped trading standards on a search. So I went into the house with Stella, she searched it from top to bottom. She went into one of the bedrooms and there was a dog bed with a pile of clothes behind and she instantly indicated on the pile of clothes. So I knew that she's found something and hidden within the clothes behind the dog bed was £25,000 in cash. So they were like over the moon trading standards. For the last nine years, Stella's been my drugs, cash and firearms recovery dog. She finds all types of drugs from cocaine, heroin, to cannabis, to ketamine. When we've been to do drugs raids at addresses, normally you get anti, you know, the people don't like the police and they shout and, and scream at you. Whereas I have had a totally different reaction when I've been with Stella because she's a staffy. And they're like, oh, it's a staffy, it's a police dog. We can't believe you've got a staffy as a police dog. So in 2022, Stella was coming up for retirement and we got a phone call saying we've been nominated um, as one of the finalists for Crufts uh, Hero Dog Award. And it was like a big shock. And I thought, well, wow, this is incredible. In the main arena, they announced the winner live. Then they called our name out and it was, it was a big shock. PC, Claire, Jordan, Stella. Well, this is Stella, the Staffordshire Bull Terrier police dog. She has protected the nation from criminals and also changed perceptions of her breed, and she looks thrilled to have won. Very emotional as well. I was, like, fighting back the tears because I uh, just couldn't believe it. Thank you. Alongside Claire Todd, Stella's found weapons and thousands of pounds worth of drugs and cash, and she really is a true canine hero. <laughs> That's the end of our microphone. <laughs> now Stella's retired, she enjoys relaxing and uh, chilling out with our pet dogs. She uh, gets lots of cuddles, she's being totally spoiled and she deserves it. Stella doesn't realise how important she's been to the police. She's been an incredible dog and, uh, you know, one in a million really, and uh, I've been very proud to be her owner. Stella's a true hero, isn't she? And that was a much-deserved win. Also, thank you for your messages today. We've had lots of calls about those wanted faces. So I'm back with Jill from the National Crime Agency. Uh, let's talk about two of these. You're looking for John James Jones. Just remind us about him. Yeah, Jones is suspected of wounding, wounding with intent um, and he has links to um, Ibiza and is previously from Lancashire. And Jack Mayle? And Mayle is suspected of supplying MDA, MDMA and diazepam. And he has links to Spain and also is from the uh, is known to be from the Surrey area. We can see as well with Jack, he's got some quite distinctive tattoos, one uh, on the side of his face there. Jill, thank you again so much for, for coming in. So do you recognise any of these people? Do you know where they are? If so, then please pick up the phone, get in touch. The number to call, as ever, is on the screen below. Thanks for watching. If you've been affected by any of the issues raised, support is available at bbc.co.uk forward slash action line. Remember, you can also watch us on iPlayer for seven days after broadcast. We're back again next week with more appeals that we need your help with, including a 50-year-old missing person case that is now a murder investigation. We just need to know why, why he was killed and who by. In the meantime, have a great weekend and we'll see you right here next Monday at 10am.